in one place and did one thing or two things, but not think about maybe if they lived in this Cleveland area, maybe they were a part of building the terminal tower. Maybe your ancestor might have been a part of refurbishing, and that's I'm going to use that term for lack of a better one, your, your clock tower. You know, about 20 years or more ago, you redid the inside of your clock tower. So maybe your ancestor was a part of that. And there is no record that says that they did that. You might find some photographs. You have to check with the librarian, with the historical society, to see if maybe there are some um, photographs that might help you. So let's just think about how we research. This, we, we research our ancestors and we research them so that when we finish, we give that information to our descendants. We skip over ourselves. We forget to tell the descendants about us. So our research really, in my opinion, has a great big hole in it. And that hole is you and me. So my suggestion is before or during you writing your ancestor's life story, write your own. And hopefully through this um, presentation, you can see how your ancestor's story can change and be a better story if you are a part of it. If there's someone that you're writing about that you knew, that you had a connection with, when you write about yourself, you're going to put a different flavor on that ancestor that you touched during your lifetime. So remember, eventually, you're going to be an ancestor. So try to leave as much information as you can. You know, the coronavirus has, transfer, has transformed our life. So maybe you want to keep a journal. I don't know if you did or not. Uh, I kept a journal on, on what I did and how I did it and what things changed. I even tried to write some narratives about it. I think about me. Think about you. What kind of music do you like? Can you cook? Can you dance? Do you like plays? Can you write poetry? Share your feelings that you had with others. Are you writing letters still? Or have you written letters? Do you have a box of letters somewhere that you are just preserving? And hopefully you, you want somebody to find them if you haven't already given them away. But just think about that. That expresses feelings that's going on around you. Um, what was your surviving techniques when things got so bad? in your family? How did you live? And did you have to gain some new skills? Do some self-evaluation. I'm going to tell you this right now for me. I did some self-evaluation and I realized I'm addicted to the grocery store. I don't know about you, but without a grocery store, I was about to lose my mind. All my friends are doing the grocery store. They're calling up and having it delivered. Not Debbie Abbott. She's going to the grocery store. I'm addicted. So I wrote about that. So all I'm suggesting is that you keep a little you don't have to write pages and pages and pages. I found these little notes as I was preparing this, this topic. And uh, Sandra Milton, who you may know is a member of the African American Genealogical Society. And she did a lecture for us and it was called In Six Words. And that's all you need. You just need six words, words that will jar your memory about what you wanna write about. So it doesn't have to be pages. It could be two paragraphs. It could be one paragraph. And so I'm going to share with you how I used six words to help me 
to remember what I want to write about and, and to be able to get it on paper. So um, the other one that you see here is might as well eat that cookie. And that was done by Paula Dean. That's just six words. Okay, six words, might as well eat that cookie. Now, that might mean a lot of things, but if I use those six words as a, as a title or a memory jogger, I would probably be telling you about how many times I tried to lose weight, how many times I went on a diet, or I might want to tell you about actually my favorite cookie, which is chocolate chip. Might as well eat that cookie will jar some information for me that I think my descendants ought to know. Here's some other six word clues. Think about it. Life is living through the rain. Six words. Maybe you had a tough time, but you survived. Those six words may jar your memory. Under the kitchen table, childhood memories. You remember hearing your, your parents talk about things that you shouldn't have heard? You could write about that as well. And then for me, because I am not computer literate, I've had to learn this and it's been difficult for me. I have six words that I can write about the computer, me learning how to use the computer. Forgot password. Couldn't log on yesterday. That's only six words. And I could probably write two pages about learning the computer, but Two paragraphs would probably be good and it would be all right. So I want you to start thinking about your life in motion. I want you to remember your childhood and beyond. Look at photographs you have at home and heirlooms that have been passed down. If you have newspaper clippings, look at that. Think about the traditions you had and then write about those events and write about events that were going on during your lifetime. Don't matter how big or how small. If it's important to you, then write about it. So let me just share something with you. Sometimes I say I should make the audience sign a form that say they won't go back out and tell all of my business. But it's too late now. So let me just tell you what made me decide that this needed to be done. I've got nieces and nephews, and I only have two uh, nieces and nephews, a niece and a nephew, only two of them, who know that I've been married before. So I need to explain that because if they are going to research their Aunt Debbie, they are going to need to know that they may have to look for me under a different name. And they need to know what time frame that was. And so I thought, you know, I better tell them. I better leave that information. The other thing that made me think about doing this was one uh, Saturday, I was at the art museum with, with these nieces, well, two of my, three of my nieces, um, and they are the grandchildren of my brother, and I'm with them, and I don't know where he is, and I asked, I said to myself, talking to myself, as I do a lot lately, I said, uh, where, 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 where's, where's Butch, and then they're staring at me, and then I look at them, and I said, where's your grandfather? And they said, are you looking for our grandfather? I said, yes, I'm looking for my brother. And then one of them said, who is your brother? And I said, it's your grandfather. And she said, he has a sister. She was as surprised as she could be. And that's when I realized that as small children, they, they don't really understand the relationships. And I said to her, Yes, why do you think you call me Aunt Debbie? And she said, because that's your name. She never connected the relationship. So I know as they get older, they'll know. 
But as little children, she had no idea. So I thought I need to leave this information for them. So I started looking at all of, all of my life that I thought they needed to know. So I'm going to suggest to you to write in lists. Think about all the famous people you've met. Think about your movies, your friends, uh, things that, that make you laugh, what made you cry, what about any historical events, and then just write it in small little sketches. So if we ask a question of ourselves, what talents do you have? This doll, I made it because I can sew. I could make a man's suit if you needed one. I just don't do it now. But I made this doll for one of my close friend's daughter. And she now is probably almost 40. But she still has this doll. I made this doll. So do you have talents? What are your talents that we don't know anything about? At church, I don't have any talents for church. I can't sing. I can't dance. And then all of a sudden, we were going to have a handbell choir. I thought, oh, maybe I can do that. The handbell choir required that you know or be able to read music. All right. Another deficiency for me, I can't read music. But I decided I was going to try it anyway. So I took a class. I registered at Cuyahoga Community College. I took a reading, music reading class. And then I came back. And I joined the handbell choir. See me back here in the back? This is our choir. But I have to say that taking music reading was not enough. And eventually, I had to leave the choir because I made too many mistakes. If I missed a note, I couldn't come back. So they let me use the talent that I had. I haven't left the choir. Now I introduce them before they play. I need to tell that story. I can cook too. A lot of people don't know that. I can cook. So I could leave recipes. I could leave, leave um some photographs, you know, you have people over to your house and you take pictures and and you have people who want to, to take your recipes home. Keep those. Keep them in a file. Put them in a journal. Make a cookbook. Talk about the skills that you have. We tend to think our ancestors just stay in one place. Write about all the people that you met. You can see the people that I've met in my, in my time, um, but how can I, when I started making this list, because I never really thought about it before. When I started making this list, I ran out of space on this slide. When I started looking at all the places where I've been. I ran out of space on this slide, but then I just decided I'll just go on and make, make something else, make some more. I have been everywhere. And so it might happen that when somebody's researching Debbie Abbott and she doesn't show up in the census, it could be that she's someplace else. So think about you. I know you don't stay home. I know you take vacations. I know you go to visit your children or your grandchildren. Those are important places to tell your descendants where you have been. Think about historical moments. I have lived through the assassination of Martin Luther King. The assassination of John F. Kennedy. I can tell you exactly where I was when those events happened. 
I can tell you where I was the moment that this country elected its first African-American president. I've lived through that. I have lived through Katrina. I've lived through the Kent State shootings. And I can remember wanting to go to Kent State when I finished high school and my mother telling me I couldn't go because they were shooting there. I did get to go later. That's after it had all calmed down. But I couldn't go when I first finished high school because of that. I've lived through that. I've lived through 9-11. And then if you look to the right at the top, you got four photographs at the top, and it's all the royal family. I have been fascinated with the royal family since I was about 14 years old. So there is probably absolutely nothing that I don't know about this family. And I will tell you, there was a period of time when I thought that I would become the wife of Prince Charles. My mother never disputed it. I kept saying, he's going to see me, he's going to fall in love, and we will get married, and I will be the Queen of England. The only thing she ever said was, all of those things might happen, but I can guarantee you, you will not be the Queen of England. He came to Cleveland. My mother and I went to see him. I fell out of love that fast, but I never let the royal family go. So I have watched their every step. I've watched him marry Diana. I've watched them have William and, and Harry. I've watched William have have George. I've watched all of that. And I call them, those are my, my two boys. And now I've got grandchildren. I've got four of them with one on the way. So I talk about that all the time. I have, um, I'm, I was fascinated with the Beatles. I watched them um, hang the, the chandelier downtown Cleveland in the, in the uh, theater district. I am a Cavaliers fan, a diehard Cavaliers fan. None of these things that I'm saying to you right now will you find in a um, courthouse, in a library. You might find the events but you won't find how those events affected me as an ancestor. And then, of course, we've all lived and are still living through the coronavirus. All that's historical. I talked earlier about the computer. Think about it. Think about the computer. How it has evolved. Don't forget that we start out, at least I did in my life, start out with typewriters. We went from manual typewriters to electric typewriters. We were using carbon paper and then no carbon paper. Then we went to the computer. Here, I'm talking about the evolution of the television. That tall 1960 Phil Cole that you see right here in the middle, we used to have that television in our house. Can you imagine? I was lucky to even find an image that looked like that. We had that television in our house. And now, look how televisions have evolved. We have, we went from having these little small ones where you could take when you went on a picnic. We have what they call this console model right here. And now our televisions look like this. And before this, the televisions had antennas that look like this, or rabbit ears, as we would call them. But at my house, this television has rabbit ears. All of my televisions like this have rabbit ears. And that's because I have no, um, uh, what they call live streaming, I don't have cable. I don't have anything but 
though that antenna. Oh, oh, I'm going backwards. Sorry. I don't have anything but that antenna. And that antenna brings 48 um, downstairs. It brings them 48 channels. Upstairs in my, in my family room, it brings in 62. So it's amazing what you can do and not have all of those other things. Now, grant you, I do miss some programs, but I got friends that I can go and watch those other programs. And then just look at how I look right here. This is me and my brother and the TV behind us. And you see the rabbit ears and everything. But I didn't know what this thing was. So I had to try and look that up. It's a clock. Can you imagine? It's a clock that looks like a, a plane propeller. But that's the clock that we had. And that's sitting on top of our television. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about me. And this is what I've titled my story. My life best told in chapters. Six words. That's all it is. And I broke my life down in the chapters and I wrote the chapter titles out before I started to write because I needed something to jar my memory so that I would know what I wanted to write about. So here's just six of them. Uh, we're not going to look at all of them as we go through this, but I have 16 or 17 chapters. This is just six of them, all six words. Home is where my story begins, six words. Big bed, wonderful memories, happy days. I'm writing about my grandparents. That jars my memory to know that's the story that comes under that chapter. Always an American, therefore I can. It's the principle of my elementary school. I've taught you all I know. That's my mother. My life at East Tech High School. I had a fabulous time in high school and I thought I needed to write about it. And then my very last chapter, this is not chapter six, I think it's chapter 17. And it's called Last Chapter, New Address, Beautiful Place. It's my death. And believe it or not, I've written that one. That's probably one of, of maybe six or seven chapters that I have written all the way through. It is, it is basically done, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So here are some photographs. Make sure you look at photographs. Bring your photographs out. Look at them. Label them so that your descendants will know who the people are. And then just pay attention to them. And I look at this one, and I say, this is a happy little girl right here, but... As I went through my life, I realized that must have been the only dress I had. I have on that dress in every photograph, just about every photograph that I have that dress on. And then as you look at these pictures, I look like I'm so much bigger than everybody else. I think I've been this size all my life, but I'm not. These are my cousins in the middle and my brother. And I'm only, what, three years older than the cousin sitting next to me and only two years older than my brother. I look like a giant. And then you see me with my nieces. I have those two nieces. And then down at the bottom, I found this photograph from a cousin, a cousin in New Jersey. That's me. I asked for pictures. She sent the picture. She says, this is... Lucille, but I don't know who that baby is. That baby is me. And then the other one is my mother and me and my brother and my uncle in the back. So I had to label those photographs. I treated me as an ancestor. I started with the 1940 census. I wasn't born in 1940. My grandparents were. So I found them in the 1940, and I did that because I'd lived with them practically all of my life. I didn't have a picture of the house, but the Cleveland Public Library did. And so the Hudson Public Library or the Historical Society should have or may have pictures, old pictures of homes. 
Cleveland Public has the pictures from the city of Cleveland. Houses that have been demolished. They have pictures of them before they demolished them. So here I find the picture of my house. We lived on that first floor. And here's the, the census that goes with it. And so when I compare that, it brought back memories because I knew everybody in that house. This is a six family house. You see, there's only one address and then you come down the list. There's no more addresses. And that's because all of these people live in that house. There were four families in the front, two on the first floor, two on the second floor and two in the back. And so what's interesting, even though I was not born at that time, I know all of those people and I can tell a story if I needed to. I checked the newspapers. The Cleveland um, Colin Popes carried uh, a column called Stork Talk and it listed babies that had been born within maybe two or three weeks and lo and behold, there I am. All of these babies are listed by the names of their fathers. So it tells me that we need to make sure that we do some collateral line or fan club research. No mothers are listed here, just the fathers. And it gives his address, 2066 East 77th Street. I don't know anything about that. So I needed to try and find out where that was and what that house looked like. Then you'll see my aunt to the right. She's uh, holding me as a baby. And uh, my brothers say that that's the proof that we have that I came here with the same size head that I have now. They always teased me about the size of my head. I'm going to tell that story. And then I wanted to know what the day was like when I was born. So check the newspaper. Check the newspaper on the day you were born. You can Google it. If you can find the, the um, uh, actual newspaper, they'll probably have a map and show you how it was raining or not raining or snowing or whatever. But for me, this was for Cleveland. This was in the uh, Almanac, Weather Almanac. And it told what the temperature was like on the day that I was born. And I can even tell you about. And then because I could find a, uh, a picture of the house that I lived in most of my life, I went back to the library and said, what about these other addresses where I've lived? And I found them. The one to the left, of course, is that 2066 East 77th Street. I've never seen it before because it's torn down already. I've never seen it. But we must have lived in that apartment complex. I don't know what floor, but that's where we were. And that's where my family lived when I was born. The one at the top, the public library didn't have. But I remember living there. And I remember how big that courtyard was to me. And so I drove my car around there where it should have been. And it was there. They were getting ready to tear it down. That courtyard now is not so big. It's small. And then the one down at the bottom underneath it in the middle is where I lived from the time I was 16 until I got ready to go away to school. I lived in the... Um, projects as they called them. I lived in, in the public housing. And this is where I lived from 16 on. And then of course, you've seen the one to the right. That's where I lived until I was about, well, I lived for, yeah, till I was about 16. And then we moved to public housing. I also used the library to reconstruct my neighborhood. We took the maps, we were able to put the maps together and reconstruct the neighborhood where I lived. Now, I didn't put it on this map, but I do have it. I used the city directories to fill in those 
spaces, those buildings. What are those buildings? And I was able to use the city directories to do that. And then I have the houses where I lived up here. And then my elementary school was on the corner. And then I had a set of friends, three families that lived on the next street down here. And I identified them because we are still friends today. So our principal at our elementary school, she always seemed to find a way to make sure that everybody would be involved in something. And we had a play and every child in that school was in that play. This particular time, I might've been about seven or eight, I was gonna be the MC, and I didn't wanna do it. So I think my teacher must've turned me in. I had to go to the principal's office. And I told her I couldn't do it. She wanted to know why. And I said, I just can't, I can't do it, I'm scared. And you can see on the screen, this is what she said to me. So here I am about a seven year old and this has stuck with me all of my life. She says, Deborah, you're an American. And as long as you live, you will always be an American. And the last four letters of American spell, I can. She says, I don't ever wanna hear you say what you can't do and I'll see you tomorrow night on that stage. My friends say she created a monster. I said she created a self-confident little girl. And then here are my friends again. These are the people who lived in those houses on that map. As I said, we're still friends. We still take care of each other. We still do the things that we need to do to stay afloat. These are my neighborhood friends. These are my grandparents. Big bed, wonderful memories, happy days. I have that bed at my house. I used to think it was huge. It is not. It is just a full-size bed. I used to think it was the biggest thing ever. And as a three or four-year-old, you know, you we couldn't get in that bed unless somebody put us there. And we only were able to go there if we were sick. So I can talk about that as well. My grandmother used to make cough syrup. So if we got sick, she would make this cough syrup and then we would get instantly well. Well, the cough syrup was sweet and it was good. And we used to fake being sick. So we'd walk around the house and cough a little bit. Couldn't cough a lot because if you coughed too much, you didn't get the cough syrup. You, got, you had to eat some Vicks Vapor Rub. So I'm a living witness that Vicks Vapor Rub will not kill you. I have eaten a lot of Vicks Vapor Rub. But I was able to find this recipe. This is not a recipe in my grandmother's handwriting, but I did find it at the New England Genealogical Society, what is called American uh, Ancestors. They had a recipe collection and the cough syrup recipe was in that collection. So look around for things that you need. My grandfather, and again, you see my brother and my cousin, and that's my grandfather. And he and I had, a, I'd say, a special relationship. I've done his history. I've traced his family back, and I can tell you all about him. But when I include him in my history, he changes a little bit because the part of me is not in the story that I wrote about him. Before I lived with him, I would come to that house and I would stand in front of him and I would say, I'm here. He would say, when'd you get back? And he'd rub my back and he'd pull my nose and he'd say, I hardly know you. And then he would pull my earlobe and say, I ain't seen you in ears. And I would be so tickled. And I would just look at him and say, I was just here yesterday. And then I'd just run off. And I would do that every time I came in that house. He would take me fishing. And you couldn't go, I couldn't go until I could put the bait on the hook. So we'd go, he and my uncle, and I'd have to pull up, pick up the worms and put the worms and things on the hook. 
and then we could go fishing. And then I'm talking to him. And he would say, Debbie, you got to be quiet. And I would be quiet for about two seconds. Then I'd say something else. And then eventually he would look at me and he said, if we're going to catch some fish, you have got to shut up. And then I would be quiet and then we would catch some fish and I would be so happy. That story will not appear in the story that I write about him. It only appears in my story where I bring him into my life. And then I can bring everything that I wrote about him into my life. And he turns into really a different type of person. My mother, we ate, um, we ate cream of wheat every single morning. I can't think of having anything else in the morning but cream of wheat. But my mother, I think, trying to make it so that we probably would not complain. She put what I call surprises in it. She called them surprises too. So sometimes you would sit down and there would be ice cream in your cream of wheat. You wouldn't know it until you stirred it up. So sometimes there would be ice cream, raisins, bananas, strawberries, you name it, it would be inside that cream of wheat. My mother used to dye. She used to dye rice. So we ate a lot of rice. So sometimes we'd have white rice. Sometimes we'd have yellow rice. I even, we even, I remember having one time some kind of blue rice. She put some dye in it. As children, we just ate it. And we didn't have birthday parties and we didn't get presents. What we got was, it's your birthday. And therefore, you can have anything that you want for your birthday, for your dinner. And so I would always have a chocolate cake. I would have fried chicken. I would have rice and gravy. And then you always had to have a vegetable. And I would have spinach. I would have ice cream. And I always would have chocolate ice cream. But because we couldn't afford to just have chocolate ice cream at home, we had the Neapolitan. And I'm sure you remember that strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. And I would just dig out of the chocolate side and have my chocolate ice cream. When we turned 10 and a half, seven and a half, on that half birthday, we got a candle. We got a cupcake with a candle in it. No presents, just food. And it was wonderful. And here I am, as old as I am, my brother is 60 plus. And he still celebrates his half birthday. It just tells you how that has come through the uh, generations. Christmas was wonderful for me. Christmas was a time where we just um, did everything for Santa Claus. I knew we had to pay Santa Claus at the whole lot because he cost money. But we would have uh, sugar cubes for the reindeers, Coca-Cola for Santa. We would have chocolate chip cookies for Santa. When I realized that Santa couldn't come through the chimney because the, uh, when I looked up under that fireplace, that hole was too small. We put a key up under the mat for him to come through the door. We had a silver tree. I'm sure you are familiar with that. And it had a strobe light on it, so it changed colors. So I can talk about that. And then in the mornings when we would get up on Christmas Day, we had to clean up after Santa Claus. I don't know if you know how messy he is, but he really is a mess. And the sugar cubes would be gone. The Coca-Cola, he would have gotten the, the bottle opener out. And he would have gotten an ice tray out and put ice in the glass. And then he'd put his Coca-Cola in there. And there would be Coke on the table. He never put the tray back. So there would be melted ice on the table as well, as well as cookie crumbs. So we would have to clean all that up before we could go to the tree to see what was there. I started to bring in my family. So here are my, my, my sister. My mother and father have been married twice. Each one of them had children before they married each other. So my sister at the top belongs to my father. My oldest brother, uh, which is the tallest one in the picture below, belonged to my mother. 
and then me and my brother belong to the two of them. My father in the next picture is in the middle. And then he has two brothers. He had, well, it's really, I think it's six of them, but these are two of his brothers. And so I talk about them as well. I have a lot of memories with my cousins, one on each side, um, because we traveled together. The cousin that you see me with in front of the Rock and Roll Museum is Robin. And Robin is this little girl right here. That's who that is. And she and I have vacationed together and she came to see me uh, not too long ago. And we went to the Rock and Roll Museum and we just had a good time. She is my cousin on my mother's side. That is our grandmother up in that corner. My other cousin is Peaches and our grandmother in that corner, in that left-hand corner. So if she is my cousin on my father's side and Robin is my cousin on my mother's side. And we all, and we travel. Then I looked for me in the newspaper. How wonderful. I remember writing a letter to the plane, to the uh, Cleveland Press. So here I am, and I couldn't believe it. I found it. I'm writing in support of the principal. Can you imagine a 16-year-old and what, what the principal was doing? Well, here's the article. I have I remembered that, but I didn't remember anything else that I found in the newspaper on me. So I'm suggesting that you research yourself in the newspaper and see what you find. Here is an article about homecoming at my high school. And it jarred a memory. I forgot all about this. My high school, my uh, homecoming was a little bit, I was not a happy camper. Let me put it like that. I lost this homecoming crown by two votes. I don't know who didn't vote for me, but I lost it by two votes. But the, excuse me, the sad part is every picture that I found, I look as mean, as mean as possible. So that tells me I was still mad. So here's a picture of the whole court. I was the first runner up and I am not smiling. I'm the only person in this picture not smiling. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I had a was an exchange student. I don't remember any of these articles. I only remember the event. So this helps when I write. So I was one of 41 Cleveland students who went abroad. And then this is when we came back. I don't remember this either, but this is when we came back. I remember going and I remember coming back, but I don't remember anything special happening to us when we came back. But here we are and there I am. Look at that hair. I said, oh my God, I have never seen this picture before. I have no idea who these two guys are. I just know that they are part of the 41 people, 41 students who went abroad for the summer. I checked my uh, employment newspapers and their archives and I found me in there. And I found me uh, being the chairperson of the affirmative action committee. And then I also found me cooking, taking those cooking classes. And then I found me, um, this picture is me celebrating 30 years of working at Cuyahoga Community College. Now, one of the things I did realize as I went through my life, I have had the same hairdo the entire life. I've never changed. Maybe now it's time for a change. And then when I was doing this, I thought about Nancy. I said, I wonder if I could find Nancy in here. And you all know who Nancy is, Nancy Brock. Now, hopefully I've got all the right photographs, but this is her high school yearbook, 1961. And all of the yearbooks are in there, 58, 59, 60, 57 is in there too. And 
So if she doesn't remember, she can tell these stories. And I think it's good that she would tell her descendants just where to look or leave them this information, write the story. Did she participate in any of the organizations? This is the Glee Club. I think I see her right here. I think that's who that is in the Glee Club. Was she in foreign, there was a foreign affairs club there, Red Cross, cheerleaders, uh, newspaper, yearbook staff. What did you do in high school? This is foreign affairs. I think she's in here too. This is a foreign affairs club. She can tell us whether or not she participated in this. And then I look at my life as it is right now. Six words. I was the uh, commencement marshal, faculty marshal in 2010. My colleagues elected me to lead the faculty in to the student commencement. I was fortunate enough to get an invitation to President Obama's uh, inauguration. I have that at my house, the invitation, and I have both of them. I got an invitation to both. I had the opportunity to take some uh, classes from Tracy Amin. And Tracy Amin is the world class actress. She lives in Chagrin Falls. And I took these classes. I made what you see there at the top, that bowl and that um, vase. And then you can see me at the bottom with her learning how to use, how to, how to shape that clay. This is my bucket list. Look at that. Then I had the opportunity to meet uh, Smokey Robinson at the National Archives. That was a treat. That was not on planned, but there he is. And then I always wanted to get in the cockpit of a plane. And so on one of my trips to Salt Lake City, after the plane had landed, I asked the um, pilot if I could come in and sit down and he agreed. I doubt if we could do that now, but he did allow me to come in and sit down. I did the same thing when I was being interviewed on Channel 5. This is Leon Bibb's desk. I asked him to, to, if he would just get up and let me sit down. And so I could see if possibly if they needed a sub for an anchor, I thought I could fill in quite well. And then I went to Alaska. I stayed for 30 days. I dog sledded. All of that on my bucket list. And now we are in a crisis, a coronavirus crisis. This is historical. Our lives have changed because of it. So I decided that I wanted to see what was the difference between 1918 and 2020. One of the things that I found that I just couldn't stop looking at is the resemblance of this Dr. Thomas Tuttle, who was the person in 1918, who was, as, as I look at it, the same person as Dr. Fauci is to COVID-19. Dr. Tuttle and Dr. Fauci, in my opinion, looked just alike. It was startling to me. And you can tell me later if you agree. Dr. Tuttle prescribed face masks and social distancing to slow the flu pandemic in 1918. And he made a lot of enemies. So did Fauci. But it worked. Both Dr. Tuttle and Dr. Fauci fought global pandemics late in their public health careers. Both men attended Ivy League medical school. And both were commissioned as officers in the U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, Fauci first came into the eyes of the American people uh, because he led the HIV AIDS research uh, mission for President Bush. And Tuttle uh, was the lead for smallpox. So these men are almost identical and they look almost identical to me. So here's some comparisons. To the left, in the hospitals, 
1918 to the right in the hospital 2020. Look at the policemen, Cleveland police, 1918. Look how the police look. Look how we looked in 2020. Now, if you don't know, and you might want to check this wherever you are, uh, we have a police museum. So I was able to find some information in the police museum. We have to wear masks. I have about 70, 75 of them. You can see them in the middle. I got all kinds. So you can see in those photographs, though, those are coming from 1918. And they're having the same issues that we're having in 2020. So this is how I look wearing a mask in 2020. And then this is the nurse from the Red Cross. And it looks like she's wearing a piece of gauze in 1918. I told you I'm addicted to the grocery store. So I, I was going to the grocery store. So here you can see a sign outside the store that says 40 person max. And they were checking. And when they got 40, you had to just stand in line, as you see in the middle. And then you can see also to the right, you can see how uh, they were disinfecting the carts. It was just interesting how all of that was happening. And in that store where I went, where you had to stand in line, they were passing out water. So that's the water up at the top. We got that in line, standing in the store. And then they were selling what they call COVID kits. And it was just disinfectant and toilet paper. Food was a little bit scarce. This was in Whole Foods. And it had a list up telling you what was um, uh, low. And you, you they may limit the quality that you could have. And then never in my life had I seen empty shelves. But during COVID, there were empty shelves. There were signs everywhere that told you what to do. Special times for seniors to go to the grocery store. Uh, one was from eight to nine, only seniors in the grocery store. It told you about social distancing and that you were required to wear a mask. I wasn't used to going in the store and looking down at the floor to push the cart, but they had signs on the floor that told you one way in and one way out. And so you can see on the right, it tells you one way, and then it says stop. You're going the wrong way. But then somebody must have got smart, and then they started putting the signs up here, which is was better for me because I don't push a cart looking down at the floor. So here was the sign that says one way. So you only could go in that way and have to come back up in the other aisle. You remember salad bars? They don't only this anymore. I did see one the other day, though. I don't know who's going to eat it. Now, this was at Heinen's, and they had the salad bar boxed up. So this is what it looked like as opposed to this. Now it's boxed up. But they also had a, a machine called Sally the Robot, and you could get a salad out of Sally the Robot just like you would get at the salad bar. And you would just push the buttons and you could get pick out what you wanted on your salad and the machine would make the salad. And there's my little salad and it costs $6.99. I always ate a lot of seafood, but I started to eat more. And so even though that picture in the middle looked like I'm getting ready to feed a whole lot of people, that was just for me. I was making a seafood boil. And um, I started to bake more. I don't bake quite as much uh, before COVID, but I started to bake more. And then I started growing my own stuff. I started growing bell peppers and garlic and onions. And so you can see what I was, what I grew. And these are things I could pull out of my own yard. I don't have a yard big enough to hold them. I did them in flower pots. And then out of the police museum, I also found uh, a 1918 um, letter from the uh, public health department telling the people of Cleveland to close down. And then these are newspaper articles, the titles of newspaper articles that talked about what to do in 1918. 
Then, of course, we did the same thing. But then in May, uh, DeWine opened Cleveland up slowly. And when he did that, he opened up. I was probably one of the first ones to be in there because I had things need to be done. I needed to have my my uh, flu shot and I needed to have my mammogram. And so I went on the first day that the hospitals opened. I was the only one in there. You probably couldn't be any safer than that. And the dentist's office was the same way. I also went back to the fitness center and you can see that in the fitness center where I go, you only could have, uh, nobody could just walk in off the street. You had to have an appointment. You had to do it 48 hours in advance. They had the water fountains all covered up. You had to bring in your own, um, wa your own water bottles, your own mats, your own towels. And then you can see me here trying to exercise a little bit with my mask on. And then I went and had my eyes checked, and I just thought this was just wonderful. Everybody was in, was trying to do right. And this was just the other day, where on the door, they have this sign that says, masks required prior to entry. And then when you go inside, all of the advertisements for the eyeglass, those uh advertisements, they had put masks on those people. I just thought that was just, just ingenious to do that. So I took a picture. So everybody is trying to stay safe. Zoom has consumed our lives. You're looking at me on Zoom now. It has, it has, has taken us to another level. So before COVID, I was taking a course on, uh, in person at the Shaker Heights Public Library called Cook the Book. When COVID hit, Cook the Book went online. And what we did was pick a, pick a cookbook. Everybody had the same cookbook. Everybody picked any kind of recipe they wanted. We would bring it to the library. We would talk about the cookbook. We would taste each other's food. And we would just have a good time talking about the ingredients and if it was hard or if we liked the book or whatever. We continued it, and there we are on Zoom, cook the book. I also thought about people who had died during 2020, in, during COVID time. And uh, these three men right here, all civil rights uh, icons, uh, Joseph Laurie, John Lewis, C.T. Uh, uh, Vivian, um, Judge um, Ginsburg, and next to her is, is a bus. And I had just purchased this bus from the uh, Smithsonian probably two weeks before she passed away. Uh, who else we have? Oh, this gentleman here. This is the same person. He was 100 years old. And he's the first African-American to play professional tennis. And then, of course, we have Katherine Johnson right here. And, of course, I have her doll. Barbie made a doll of Katherine uh, Johnson. And she was what they call a human computer. She is the reason that John Glenn was able to go to the moon. And then we have... Um, this gentleman, which probably nobody knows, but since I'm one of those people who, who likes to know who works at the White House, his name is Wilson Roosevelt German. He was the former White House butler. He died of AIDS. He died of AIDS at the age of 91. He was the butler under 11 different presidents from Eisenhower to Obama. So think about the people who, who may have touched your life in some way who died during 2020 and COVID. And here's your clock tower. And I already mentioned it. Just think about um, if you even had an ancestor that might have been around when they were building it. And I think they built that around 1912 or so. 
And it used to be uh, powered by uh, uh, 3,000 pounds of, of weights to make the chimes go off. And then about 20 years or so ago, they replaced that with electric motors. Maybe your ancestor was a part of that. And then they put fountains around it when they built it so that the horses would have some place to drink and humans would too. And now they put flowers there. So you might want to think about that too. And do you have activities that center around this clock tower? And then I found the um, uh, emergency proclamation from your mayor and you may want to look at that as well. So think about the events that have happened. Think about if you want to write about what happened and what took place uh, in 2020. Roger and I was just having this conversation about voting and how different voting was in different counties. And so you may want to have that conversation as well. You know, if you participated at the different pre at precincts so that people could vote, you might want to tell that story. And now we're living through vaccinations for COVID. And you can talk about that. You can talk about how you felt. You can talk about whether or not you got the, the vaccine. And if it had any side effects, you might want to talk about that as well. Let your ancestors know. We've also, all of us, have lived through this. This is that insurrection. What did you think when you first saw it on television? Were you there? We don't know. So you might want to write a little bit about this historical event because your descendants are going to read about it. And you might as well put yourself inside of this moment. And then for me, this was something that that will probably stay with me forever. Um, it is moving through our country. It's going to be a game changer. And whether you uh, agree with what happened or not, it doesn't matter. You were here during this historic moment. Write about it. So my question is, what are you going to tell your descendants about yourselves? and about the historical moments that you've lived through. So write your story, write your life story. Leave a record of your life for future generations. It's really important. And remember that you will eventually become an ancestor. So let me quickly just show you my last chapter, new address, beautiful place, and we'll be all finished. I am going to have a resting place at the Lakeview Cemetery. I don't say that I'm going to be buried there, even though I do have a grave there. I don't know if I'm going to use it. But I did buy a, um, I went in the mausoleum. And so I do have a place if I decide to cremate myself. I have an urn. And for those people who are just going to be just devastated that I'm gone, you can get some of my ashes and wear them around your neck if you so desire. So here's what the mausoleum looks like at Lakeview. And you can see that uh, um, you can be inside of, of a vault, which is what this is. Or you can be here. And this is what I have. And so my... Um, uh, a vault, my urn is going to be in one of these. And so I tell the story about the cemetery and about me, really, that I'm in a mausoleum and I'm only one mausoleum away from the president, James A. Garfield. My neighbors in this cemetery are John Rockefeller and Garrett Morgan, who invented this um, streetlight. Carl Lewis, Carl and Lewis Stokes, Elliot Ness is in there too, and my family. And then I talk about how beautiful this cemetery is. And it gives me um, some things that I never had in life. It is, the, the cemetery itself is, is full of history and diversity. And the mausoleum is heated, got air conditioning, and it has a granite line for you. I don't have that at my house. Got skylights, don't have that either. 
iron gates and a circular driveway. That's what my new house looks like. Now, not only did I put my, my information here, I also put down every person in my family that is buried in this cemetery and where they are. And then when I did that, I thought, go to the other cemeteries and write down all the other people. And I did that too. So whoever is looking at this will be able to know where every ancestor that I know of, where they are buried. So I can't tell you when I'm going to move to my new house, but I will eventually. And I look forward to your company. So just remember there are books. You can get all kinds of books in the, in the um, bookstores. There are legacy books. Uh, books where you can just put your life in lists um, and then keep think about keepsakes, special events. You save tickets for things that you do. Love letters. They would love to read those. Photo albums, recipes, jewelry, newspaper clippings. Read a little bit. See what other people are doing. See how they're writing. And then this one is the story of my life. And this is a book that you could get that helps you just jot down the things I'm talking about. And it's written by Sonny Jane Morton. And I know you know who Sonny Morton is. So just remember, history is not the past. History is the present. Facts get recorded and stories are remembered. So tell me, what's your story? And make sure that you write it down and leave it for the people who come after you. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie. It was a wonderful reminder to us all to tell our own story and to put this together. It's a great gift to our futures. Uh, we especially love the part about Nancy's pictures. And I'm very <laughs> glad that you got the clock tower history absolutely accurate. It was it accurate? Good. It was very accurate. <laughs> So I'm going to hand it over to Beth, who is our current president, and let her very quickly conduct an election. Thanks, Gwen. Um, for those who don't know me, as Gwen said, I am the current president of HGSG. This is our last meeting of the year, so we're going to conduct an election, as said. Um, we only had one nomination per position, and it's a little confusing with Zoom how we're exactly going to vote. So... I'd suggest I'll read off the nomination, and if, you, if you're in agreement, press the little raise hand button. If you have an additional person to add last minute, you can use the Q&A or the chat. Um, so first, we have up for election to president, uh, Roger Marble, and he's got his screen up over there. So everyone in favor of <laughs> Roger being president can press the little raise hand, and I think Gwen can see that, and if that doesn't work, let me know, Gwen. Yes, I can. And yes, I see them. Awesome. And then for vice president, we have nominated um, Cindy Hartman. Um, so all in favor can press the little raise hand button. All right. And I'll say for secretary, we have Trudy Painting. Treasurer. Carlene Welch, and our previous treasurer, Dick Sateva, has been nominated for assistant treasurer this year, and that is our last position. And I know with the hand raise, it's really weird, so if you have any additional nominations, any additional complaints, you can use the chat, the Q&A. If you don't want me to see it, you can message the panelists directly um, to raise any additional thoughts you might have. But of the, other than that, those were our only nominations for the position. I do want to report that Helen asked about Debbie Abbott's handouts. And if anyone else is interested in Debbie's handouts, please just email me and I'll make sure you get one. All right. And I, if you'd like to, I could email them out to the group if you want to just send it to we me. Can I can do send that it too. to them. Um, I, can I report that I see lots of hands being raised. So. Um, I think there are still a few more voting, but most of the votes are in, and I assume they're all in favor. I haven't seen anything in the chat box or the Q&A other than the request for Debbie's handout. 
Okay. And if we haven't given enough time, if you have any additional comments, any additional people who want to join the board, anything like that, you can email Gwen, the archivist, or you can respond to my email. Um, I won't be president next year, but I'll still be handling the green and other responsibilities within the group. Debbie, I want to tell you that Ed Dell thinks your presentation was totally motivational. Oh, good. <laughs> very, very good. I'm glad. I think we all need to do it. It just brings a different perspective to our ancestors, too, especially if you had a connection to them, you know. Um, as I talk about my um, grandfather, you know, I, I, I've done his research, and so I know that he's from South Carolina, and I know that he worked at a hotel, and he was a, a, a chauffeur. He was a bellman, and he was a chauffeur, and then he moved his family to Virginia from North Carolina, and then he came to Ohio. So I've got all of those pieces, but what's missing is when I talk about me and how he used to bring me these little vials of paint from he worked in the automotive he painted cars and he would bring those vials of paint home for me to paint my nails wow See, i'm gonna interrupt and tell you that we have a unanimous um vote oh, in favor of the current slate of officers so awesome um we want to pivot to roger and maybe he'll give us a few more motivational words Well, I'm not sure how motivational I can be, but uh, uh, I, I too very enjoyed the, uh, the Debbie's uh, presentation. I learned some stuff. I always enjoy learning some stuff when it comes to doing genealogical or family tree uh, research. You've done an excellent job of, as I say, putting meat on the bones. Uh, Thank you. It's, it's boring to just hear birth date, birthplace marriage date and place, <laughs> um, you know, some of the stuff you recounted and the pictures you've collected make, uh, uh, bring your life to life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty good stuff. As far as uh, what I would like to accomplish uh, as president is I would like to uh, have a website for the study group that is not two or three years out of date. Um, so I've already taken a, a small step and I'll be sending out some emails and stuff. Uh, short term, I've started a Facebook group for all members of the Hudson chapter and I'll be sending that out. And if you are on Facebook, all you've got to do is go to the group and it'll be covered in an email. And uh, that will allow us to do some immediate, quick communication back and forth. And it's uh, faster and easier than trying to email everybody. Uh, I've also uh, started looking at what we will need to do to have a new website, not part of Roots Web, because Roots Web is obviously completely out of our control. And uh, what I am going to ask for is if there's anyone who would like to uh, offer some ideas, suggestions, support, et cetera, on what they would like to see in uh, the website for the chapter, uh, we could make it essentially what we've got now, um, or we can update it. Uh, I suggest people might go to the OGS website. And if you haven't been there for a while, you'll be kind of surprised at how their mad major makeover. But the other thing you can do from the OGS website is you can go visit websites from the other OGS chapters and seeing what other similar organizations have done utilizing the web to help grow and stabilize uh, the membership of each chapter. And uh, so ideas are definitely welcome. And uh, so that's all I have for now, but I will be uh, doing some emails in the next few days. Uh, Gwen was good enough to send me the full membership list. So it has all the emails that 
uh, you folks have submitted. So if you don't get anything uh, from me or Gwen in the next, uh, let's say, week, you need to send me or Gwen an email saying, I'm here. Let us know, because I would like to get a lot of people to uh, uh, pitch in with their thoughts and what they would like to see, what they don't want to see. Uh, Excuse me. I do write a weekly blog. Got over 500 blog posts uh, on the Internet right now. So that's one task that has nothing to do with genealogy. Um, I'm already scheduled to be in... Gillette, Wyoming in July. I was in Perry, Georgia, giving genealogy talks in March. So I do have another schedule, but I will do my best to uh, always be attending whatever meeting in whatever form we do. And it's encouraging to see the new mask wearing and not wearing uh, guidelines. And I have some ideas so we could might actually have some small uh, actually face-to-face -face meetings, but I would suggest that Zoom is probably in our future for the next two or three months, and I would like to put that as kind of a goal that within three months we'll have at least the bare bones of a website, and we'll be able to hold some meetings face-to-face uh, -face, uh, somewhere in the Hudson area. So uh, that's my plan. You voted for me. You're stuck with me. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. We'll get through it with you, just like we do everything else. Um, we're looking forward to a new year and some new motivation. Um, and hopefully you'll hear from us in the next week or so. And certainly you'll have a newsletter before the fall and our new meeting schedule at that point. Um, stay in touch, everybody, and Beth will send out notes as she can. And I want you all to tease Nancy about her high school photos. Who knew that Nancy <laughs> was on the, the, what was it, the International Club, Debbie? The Foreign, the foreign uh, Club, Foreign Affairs Club. Well, we're very proud of Nancy, and it was very nice to see her high school photos. And yeah. Roger, we're going to work with you to get a website up and going. So, Thank you all, and thank you to the other new officers that have stood up and said they're willing to help. Um, I wish you all to go out and enjoy the sunshine. It's a beautiful day. And as Debbie said, take some photos and maybe start thinking about documenting our own lives for yeah. the future. Mm -hmm. Take care all, and I think we're going to call it a meeting. <laughs>